I want to welcome Agile XRM to the podcast. I've known the people at Agile XRM for the past 12 years. I've seen how their business process management tool can add massive value to complex organizational processes in sectors such as finance and government. If you have complex processes or a need for dialogues on the Power Platform or Dynamics 365, take a look at how this BPM tool can add value. You can find them at agilexrm.com or check out the show notes for more details. Welcome to the Power Platform Show. Thanks for joining me today. I hope today's guest inspires and educates you on the possibilities of the Microsoft Power Platform. Now, let's get on with the show. Hey, welcome to the Ecosystem Podcast. Today we are joined by the missing link. Sorry, he isn't here. The guy that's usually the boring one on the show, Chris Huntingford, decided that he needed a nana nap. And so he couldn't make it today. So instead of him kicking off the show and doing the introduction, Anna, why don't you take things away? (laughs) Hi, thanks. Hi, everyone. We're really happy to be here today again. um, I think today we're going to continue talking about the strategic pyramid. And just to talk a bit about what that is, I don't know, Andrew, if you want to share your screen or if you can share your screen. This is a concept where uh, we're trying to explore how technology works and how companies look at it. Um, so if you look at the the strategic pyramid and how um, how we find the, the, the actual platform ecosystem and uh, ecosystem architecture to be related to this, you'll see that the, the strategic pyramid is really a concept uh, that looks at various layers of depth when it comes to, uh, to implementing business applications and not just that, so the whole Microsoft Cloud. Last time we talked about implementing workloads a lot. Uh, so what we said was that implementing workloads is not really an easy thing. It doesn't just mean like, you know, creating a set of a power app or a set of power apps. Implementing workloads can, can actually mean implementing quite complex uh, projects that have a lot of elements but that are still potentially missing some pieces. So in our maturity level here, um, I think today we're going to go to the second layer of the strategic pyramid, and this is creating the conditions for success. So whatever we were talking last time is what uh, a lot of the Microsoft partners are still implementing at the moment. They are looking for quick wins. They are looking for uh, projects that they can just quickly map onto business applications, it being Power Platform or Dynamics or ERP, whatever you know their specialty is, uh, and then trying to then trying to just deliver that to their customers. What we're saying is that on top of implementing workloads, we must create a set of uh, conditions for success. Uh, We've been talking for a long time now about governance, about ALM, uh, about uh, full-on architecture when it comes to, to business applications and the Microsoft Cloud. And um, I guess the next step in our maturity model and what people should be doing next, we believe would be uh, creating conditions for success. Um, Then in in our next episode or in the following episodes, we're going to talk a lot about building a platform ecosystem and and finally creating strategic foundations for, uh, for our technical Uh, systems nowadays. This is all in service of uh, artificial intelligence and technological waves and us actually building interesting work. Um, And it also relates a lot uh, to a big point that we raised last time, which was 
uh, you know, it's all well and good to to keep implementing workloads. I've even heard the term lift and shift just this week still. But make sure that your specialty isn't just there because uh, at the rate that co-pilots are moving these days, uh, it's very likely that you're going to find, that people are going to find and companies are going to find little value in your own skills of implementing workloads. So a bit of a long introduction, but here we are. We are boring you today with you know, creating conditions for success. I like it. Andrew, so if we're going to drill down into that second layer today, what are your thoughts on it? And because I see, you know, although we talked about the the top layer as a lot of partners are in that space, what about that second layer down? Because I, th- I believe a lot of partners are actually playing there as well, but it's one of those ones that are ultimately going to become more AI-centric or, or managed or run in time. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so, so remember that part of the reason that we like this model of the pyramid is that as we get closer to the top of the pyramid, we find that that's where more of the talent in the industry um, lives. More of the talent in the industry is focused on implementing workloads and creating the conditions for success than, say, on platform ecosystems today. Uh, we think that'll change, and we hope that changes. Um, the same with the accessibility of uh, these sorts of activities to AI technologies, right? So, listen, back. I'm, I'm going back in my mind to 2019, and uh, um, Back then, I think that was the beginning of uh, Microsoft partners and technology practitioners and also customers starting to think about, hey, maybe we should be focused a bit more on conditions for success than on just implementing the workload, right? So for several years, this has really been dressed up in the the language of um, governance, right? So I've said recently that we're the, the big change right now is that we're moving from governance to strategy. Um, And there's a lot wrapped up in that. And I think this is what we're going to really pick apart today, right, is how much of creating the conditions for success is governance versus enablement. And there's a big difference there, even though everyone seems to be really obsessed with governance still. Um, But frankly, those are table stakes. It's time to move on. It's time to diversify a bit. Yeah, yeah, we got it. Governance. If you don't have it, though, you're cooked. You're done. End of conversation. Um, so that's, I think, where we're jumping off from today. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I, I think so. And in, in my opinion, that's a really, really, uh, great point you raised there because creating conditions for success is not just about governance. In fact, from my experience working with partners, a lot of them have problems with application lifecycle management. I don't know if you guys had this experience and how how did we get there and how how are people trying to solve this issue right now? I was just going to say let let let's bring this back really quickly. Let's let's bring our our venerable graphic back for a second and and just level set everyone. So when we think about the conditions for success, what we're really thinking about is five pillars of work. Um, and they are, you can see them here, but for those who are just listening to the podcast, they are platform management, uh, enterprise architecture, application lifecycle management, or ALM, the mature security model, and user and organizational empowerment, right? So these, and you know, we, we can pull the string on each of these, but um, you know, ALM, which I think includes the discipline of actual proper ALM and DevOps best practices, but also includes some of the you know, technical capabilities around pipelines and source control and, you know, how we deploy and manage um, workloads and technical services. So these could be apps, these could be uh, uh, dynamics apps and modules, but they could also be um, infrastructure services, say infrastructure is code from a, you know, from a, a, a pure um, Azure infrastructure perspective. So yeah, ALM is definitely a, a, a big part of this, but you know, those are the those are the really the five key pillars here of, of what we're we're talking about. One thing I would say is this is a, a part of the pyramid, which I I've definitely read the paper now, so it's part yeah. of the pyramid that I <laughs> that I think has the most confusion around it. 
And and what I mean by that is, as soon as you say creating conditions for success or creating governance models, people go, yeah, 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 but I, I've got a COE. But they say something else. They say something that really, and we're going back to, what was it, Anna, you said you have beef with it. And I always say it grinds my gears, which is people, when you say, do you have a COE? They say this beautiful thing, which is, yes, I've installed it. What, what have you installed? And because Microsoft is so good at marketing and Manuela's team has done such a brilliant job at marketing their proposition for this, whenever they think of COE, they just assume it's their tool, which is the COE start kit. And whenever they start thinking about creating conditions for success, they think about the governance and the tooling rather than the entirety of the enablement or, or all the rest of the security that goes with it, all the rest of the, the enablement factors that go along it. It's not just about the tooling itself. But it allows it, it enables the rest. So sorry, just going on a bit of a, a, a bit of a, a frustrated point there because I've had this conversation this week, which is, what's your foundational layer of success? You know, what, what have you enabled? What does your COE look like? And they go, we've installed it. And I go, well, that's not what I asked. So the challenges are obvious, obviously a global challenge, right? Because I'm coming across that all the time. Oh yeah, we put it in last year, so we have a COE. Uh, no, you don't. Have you done anything on it since? No. Nope. Ah, so, and I think it's created a lot of confusion, this concept of COE. And what I am finding, <clears throat> you have to take a step back. The minute you're wanting to touch stuff in an organization that the big folks play in, and I'm talking about systems of record type systems that have been in for years, SAP, for example, when they look at um, making an ecosystem um, work, they take it from a DevSecOps perspective, right? And I find if you do not have that discussion up front, if you're really going to scale in an organization, you have to get that story right and you have to get sign off from a DevSecOps perspective. You have to get buy in of the security implications of connected systems and honoring of people's privilege, you know, based on their security profiles across those systems. So I'm not even taking it from the perspective of exposing data outside of an organization. I'm talking about exposing data to people inside an organization that is confidential. Payroll's a classic example, right? And so people are fearful because they have had history in the in these larger organizations where people have exposed dumb things, right? And people have gone, oh, what's the CEO making? Hey, what's going on here? And so this has happened in the past. I, I've got customers where they are absolutely fearful of giving access to SAP data because they are worried or connecting or, or making a connector to these things because they are worried about honoring of governance across ecosystems um, inside their organization. So I, I'm finding the issue is not technically can we do it? The issue is what's the security implication of doing it? Until you've had that conversation and put it to sleep, you're going to have barriers because I'm seeing it even in the posts I've been doing a lot lately on LinkedIn around SAP and the Power Platform story together. The resistance organizations have, and it was interesting, somebody from Slumberjay jumped on my thread a couple of weeks ago who said, mate, our org is like, no, like our, our SAP folks are saying, no, we don't want you, you know, to, to integrate at that level. We don't, you know, even though they're a massive user of, of the Power Platform, there's this resistance because it's fear of the unknown and also the security integration um, component or the security profile of the organization hasn't been unpacked and agreed on properly rather than just shutting the doors and just saying no. There hasn't been that education and learnings. Just wanted to, to give an example as well because I had the exact same example. Organization doesn't want to integrate SAP with uh, dynamics at the time because of security implications and all of the things that they didn't trust. Um, <clears throat> but the systems had to communicate because you've got the same data, folks. Like you're working in the same firm. You need to use the same components, right? So <laughs> analysts and, I don't know, important people, quants, right? They would copy lines of code and JSON and paste it in the World Wide Web to prettify it, to be web. able to 
Exactly. I like. I had. <laughs> is that Tim Berner? Is that Tim Berners Lee on the on the line all That's of a sudden? The, <laughs> no, but that was, wasn't that crazy? So because nice. <laughs> so because um, so because the organization did not trust the security and governance component of the power platform and dynamics. People had to jump through hoops to actually, uh, you know, to actually do their job. So they would paste super important information into random software and websites on the internet so that they could uh, do API calls and things like that. But that's what they do with ChatGPT now, anyway. So <laughs> that's just describe the entire the entire era of uh, of of. of- AI technology. <laughs> and, and I'm happy that you took us in, in that direction, right? Because I think that it's, it, it's important to call out here that within the Microsoft community, right? There's some, there's some strange subcultures at work, right? And everyone sort of knows all, all you have to do is go to, um, you know, go to a, a Microsoft conference and see that the same crowd of people is running over to <laughs> the data platform sessions. And there's a different crowd of people that is running or running over to the power platform sessions and, and never the, never the, the two shall meet. But, you know, there is, there is a, there is a very unique business applications, power platform subculture that has emerged around this topic in in the Microsoft space, right? So this podcast just now fell into the trap of it. We started talking about creating the conditions for success, and immediately we jumped to talking about how how people talk about, oh, I've deployed the COE or I've installed the COE, which, by the way, surefire way to get me to not take you seriously as a technology practitioner is to use phrases like, I installed the COE. Like, you say that, we're done. And that's it. That's my absolute bugbear. That, I, I, it frustrates me so much. But it also shows client maturity, which is, you know, when you ask at the beginning, you know where they are on their journey. You go, well, right at the beginning. Fantastic. We've got so much to talk about. Have a coffee. Sit down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of like a drinking game. Can you get can you get someone to talk about installing the COE? We don't even need to have an assessment <laughs> or a workshop after that. We know where you are. We, we, we know what you've done. It's going to be a fun couple of years, yeah. (laughs) I do think, though, that it's important to say that even there, we're just talking about a technology that is specific to the power platform realm. And I think that the reason that you jump there, that one jumps there, is because there is this, frankly, it's peculiar, um, this subculture around governance and creating the conditions for success when it comes to Power platform, but there's so much else out there um, across the Microsoft cloud, right? So, you know, when we're talking about ALM, for example, we're not just talking about, I, and I said this earlier, we're not just talking about deploying apps. We're talking about sometimes deploying infrastructure, or sometimes we're talking about deploying data platform components. When it, we talk about platform management, which is where the COE starter kit lives, we also should be in a true ecosystem setting. We also should be talking about Azure Monitor. We should be talking about App Insights. We should be talking about, you know, a whole range of, of technologies. And I think that if if people take nothing else away from this conversation today, it's that the extent of creating the conditions creating the conditions for success does not end at your particular chosen area of the technology. And that's really important. And I think actually it's not, and, and we say it's, everything's tying back to uh, to the past podcast, which I love, you know, it's that continuation, but it's not just about the tech as well. It's about all the, all the boards, all the governance you put around it within the people, within the process. And so we can't, we can't remove that either. So the governance boards, the, you know, the security boards that Mark highlighted there, which unless you go in and pease a client and say, we can control this, we have processes, we'll take it through TDA, business design authorities, etc. That also comes part of setting that, 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 that enablement layer of excellence to ensure everything else can then be built on so it's not just about the tooling
The 90 Day Mentoring Challenge is a comprehensive program to help you take your Microsoft business application career to the next level. Since 2018, more than 790 people from 67 countries have benefited from this program. I've heard from past participants that the 90 Day Mentoring Challenge helped them advance their careers. From switching jobs, starting companies, to gaining industry recognition like MVP Award, or full-time employment at Microsoft. Enrollments are currently open for the next cohort, which starts on the 1st of January, 2024. Find out more at ako.nz365guy.com. That's ako.nz365guy.com. So I've been I've been helping some of the CIOs that I work with set up what we've called their ecosystem design authority. And, you know, basically what we're doing there is we're taking a pretty classic, a pretty classic approach in the design authority, and we're applying it to um, the work of growing and maturing and building your cloud ecosystem. And people are so used to thinking in terms of their own technology that I see people walking into these ecosystem design authority discussions. And it's like, all they want to talk about is, oh, what I'm doing in this little particular area with this little particular project. And I'm having to explain again and again, no, you're on this call or you're sitting in this room because you are representing an entire domain within the cloud, right? You are representing the integration domain or you are representing the core business systems neighborhood, or you are representing all of the Dynamics apps deployed here, or all of the Azure infrastructure deployed here. And your job as part of an ecosystem design authority is to work with your colleagues who represent the cloud solution architects, who represent other technology areas or domains, and piece all of this together. And that is a wild concept to almost everybody because people are still very, very used to working within their little um, their little workload box. And it, it's really been eye-opening for me. We covered that on the last podcast, which is people will always stick to their lens of view, you know, which, which we can't blame them for because you, you know what you know and you, you, you've seen what you've seen. So you'll always relate it back to the knowledge you have rather than, you know, and, and I have the same situation when we talk about uh, ecosystem enablement, we go straight to Microsoft. You go, what about AWS? What about Google Cloud? What about all the other things out there outside our sphere of knowledge? You know, so I absolutely agree. With that. And I know Anna's uh, from some of, some of the articles, et cetera, you pushed out that that's a lot more your, your world of, of thought, isn't it? It is. It is a hundred percent. And I think what's happening as well is that uh, sometimes executives do not see this gap very clearly uh, because they believe that if they have uh, a very good team and you know leadership for an area, and then they have really good teams and leadership for other areas, let's just say, you know, business applications and then Azure, then then that's enough. You talk to them and they're like, no, we do it all. We have everything. We go in and we do everything when in point of fact, they do not because they either sell one or they sell the other and they don't even think about AWS or Google Cloud. And the only place where you are actually creating conditions for success for anyone who's using any other technology that then Microsoft is because they came to you. It's because they were like, oh, we're doing ecosystem architecture and we'd like to tap into business applications, dynamics, Azure, whatever it is, you know. That that's the only scenario when you see anything like that. So, guys, how do we how do we recast creating the conditions for success in an ecosystem world? I think that lots of folks have this down when they're just working in terms of, say, data platform or Azure infrastructure or power platform or, you know, a Google or an AWS technology. How do we recast this? What does what what does creating the conditions for success look like in an ecosystem driven world rather than a 
um, slice of the technology world. So just riffing off the back of that and really extending your question, because I'm not going to answer it because I'm interested <laughs> in the answer. As in, I don't have the answer. That's why I'm not answering it. How do you get people that are deeply expertised in a stack, a ecosystem? Let's take Pega. Let's take Oracle. Let's take SAP. Let's take Blue Prism. You name it, UiPath, et cetera, ServiceNow. Um, how do you take people that are, this is their career, this is their focus area, they are embedded into the organization and they generally will have a bunch of people that report up to them, right? They are, I'm talking enterprise, right? And you've got Power Platform as a, you'll have somebody, you know, in that space, Dynamics, you know, BizApps, M365, et cetera. How do you bring those parties together around a common core and vision that is not all about them defending their territory? or defending that why theirs is the best way to do it. You know, I've come up recently very strongly in the whole Pega area. We've got 300 Pega developers, so we should be doing it with Pega. But uh, what's it costing you, like, for doing some of these things? And what's your backlog like and things like that? And it's kind of like there's kind of this resistance to a multi-ecosystem play. They're like, this is our system. We'll defend it. We won't look at the other part. How do you bring people together? Because this is not a technology discussion, really. It's a people discussion. It's a behavioral one, yeah. And I think that there is a reason why we even have that. Uh, even in this day and age, we really, really value deep expertise. So a PEGA developer, they're going to be like, no, I'm not going to waste my time doing some of the uh, some of this project, you know, developing some of this project in Pega and then learning how to integrate it with something else and trying to make data flow into something else and so on and so forth, because that's time wasted for me. I can get such a high salary, you know, with just my area or if I'm security and compliance, if I'm infrastructure, if I'm um, I don't know, open AI. I don't want to waste my time like that. My way is, is the best way. Thank you. It's just mm -hmm. the way it is. I'm just going to do what I always do, which I say, uh, I, I do a load of rambling and then, and then Andrew sort of somehow, sort of, he's my own personal chat GPT and he just summarizes what I actually meant. It's a, it's a lovely relationship we have. So you, you're, you're outsourcing just like Mark does. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's how it that's how it works. <laughs> His five dollar jobs go to the web. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> send, send, send me, send me you are my Fiverr dot com, Andrew. That's what that is. <laughs> <laughs> send me the invoice. So I absolutely agree with what you're saying there, Anna. and I think there is there is a lot of protectionism around the knowledge you have because you, that's that's people feel from the old IT. Back in the day, your knowledge was your worth and you kept it to yourself. I like to think that actually the platform world has changed that because there's so much knowledge that one cannot attain it as fast and hold it as quick as you could back in the day. But it comes to a behavioral issue. And actually, we saw this a lot. If we ignore every other piece of technology, which a lot of people are so great at doing, and actually just focus on Microsoft for a second. We saw this a lot between communities back in the day, between CRM and FNO, where yeah. FNO was always the answer for everything, mm -hmm, and CRM mm -hmm. was. And it was only when they started, we started getting more sales coming through around, actually, you know, you can stitch the two together. We, you, can, you, can, you can make your sales, you can get a, a lead, convert to an opportunity, price it out, win it, push the project, do some soft allocation, push the project over to FNO, do your project management accounting, push about what's going on is only when that started to happen the architects and the consultants started going well well how do, how do you do that over there what what is the functionality i would like to know the high level aspects of it and there was suddenly an incentive and actually if you also look at the way microsoft structured sales you know which they change every year which is just lovely and it went from actually we're not going to in incentivize you on power platform but only incentivize you on dynamics so you start getting loads of people pushing dynamics when they should have pushed power platform and vice versa and i think when it comes to behavior, that incentive, that incentive approach, as well as the environment you create, are two really important aspects. So I think what Satya Nadella has done with the, and we mentioned this last time, the hit refresh, putting people together, making the platforms more open. So you kind of have to learn SAP and other items if you want to still make yourself valuable is the way to go. But I think that's still 
going to take quite a few years to get to that point. I don't think I've really answered the question there, but I've given my view on some of the issues that, that I feel exist and some of the motivations that I think we need to start pushing towards, which is opening up the gates a bit more and making sure we're going after more clients with multi-cloud and recommending more multi-cloud approaches. I don't know we're getting to an answer, and that's okay, I feel, is that but because there'll be folks listening to this that may be able to contribute, right? They might be able to go, you know what? This is this is how you do it. This is how, you know, this is what I've seen work. So they just might have some insight that they can share with us. So if you're listening and you do have insights around this where we're obviously not really drilling to it, a how do you bring these folks together? I think that this the whole reason we're doing this show is around collaboration. It's not just us being experts by any stretch. It's about engaging with you. And if you've got insights that you can bring, you know, to this conversation, we're keen to have it. Andrew. Well, look, so so I'm happy that Will mentioned incentives, right? So because okay. I, I think that, that incentives – thank you, Will. Incentives <laughs> are such a, an important – part of this. So let me, let me try out a few ideas on, on you guys. Um, one is that from a financial perspective, whether it's a budgeting perspective, and I'm thinking from a, from a budgeting perspective, that's mostly happening inside of the end customer organization, right? So the, the, the bank or the manufacturing firm or the law firm or the retail organization, whatever it might be, that's using the technology or inside of the partner, inside of the consultancy, um, where you know, I think we're probably talking less about budgeting than we were talking about P and L, profit and loss. How you know how, how is the, the the business doing serving its customers? But incentives are hugely important here. So one, um, inside of the end customer, stop tying budgets to baskets of requirements that you then turn around and give to a technology focused team. Don't give budget and basket of requirements to your RPA team because they're going to produce the thing out of RPA. In the case of partners, where I actually see a lot of this problem existing, and it's, I think it's driven in the partner organization, I'm increasingly convinced that you should not structure P&Ls. You should not structure profit and loss, um, profit and loss around technology areas. Do not create a power platform team or an Azure infrastructure team or a security team and then tell them we're going to measure you based on the success of your P&L. If you have to break your business into P&Ls, which is a perfectly reasonable sort of reality of business, do that around industry, right? Say, listen, you're, we're, we're in the financial services space or we're in the public sector space. You're going to have a P&L. Go use whatever technology is the most appropriate technology. Otherwise, you're creating incentives. And this is in the partner space. You are creating incentives for your own people to fight with one another, right, in order to pad their bottom line, often at the expense of the customer that you are serving. So, I just think in order to really create the conditions for success in an ecosystem world, you have to stop paying people to maximize the use of their own tech, regardless of whether it is technically um, or business appropriate. And until you fix that, you, you're not going to be able to do this. Uh, you're not going to be able to do ecosystems particularly well. And then the high flying partners. You know the ones that we all we all know and love, and we can we can, we can name some of the likes of Hitachi, etc. They they are industry aligned, and they do focus on that, and that's what allows them to do so well and move so fast without getting these these random pockets of isolated myopia, which which we see in other places. So I think that's I 100% agree with you there, and I think we have seen an evolution of industry led PNL as we've moved forward. I think back in the day it was slightly different because the technology was different at that point in time. I think that another thing that uh, organizations could do is to stop uh, adding functionality into buckets altogether because that brings them back into the uh, an implementing workloads idea and reality and because a lot of the creating the conditions for success are not something that you can quantify right away. You don't see it. So it's really, really 
difficult once you've promised uh, a number of, of, of functionality and the number of features um, without taking into account the fact that you're going to have to have like a solid platform overall and you're going to have to draw a proper, you know, architecture diagram for your project and you're going to have to set, uh, you know, specific security roles and then all of this has to be compliant and everything needs to map together and, uh, you know, follow the same uh, CICD pipelines, for example, in, and instead you're just promising a button or a process or, uh, you know, any sort of sparkles instead, then you're going to get into trouble with that PNL because you're not going to be able to deliver on the conditions for success and therefore evolve and therefore create that incentive for your teams to work together, uh, you know, because a lot of that is assumed. Andrew's reading this book, you know, and he's really into his book right now. And he was telling me about... It's because I only read one book a year. I mean, yeah, that's, right. that's what the issue is. And he was telling me that we come from uh, different context cultures. And I think that's valid in software as well. So Andrew can explain this better, but just to tell you what, what my understanding was, is the fact that for me, for example, the moment we talk about something, the moment we talk about creating a project, I am immediately thinking, okay, so I'm going to need like three or four environments, and uh, this is going to be like my pipeline, and I'm going to have to get sign off from that compliance person and this compliance person your sprint zero your sprint zero stuff exactly there's going to be like a website and i'm going to have to talk to that team and this team and i'm going to have to ask the infra guy and so on and so forth so the moment we're talking about you know a project i am already thinking about all of this so before you even get a feature i want to do all of these other things but that's just my context. For me, that's just common sense. Whereas Andrew is going to go there because he comes from a different culture where Americans tend to explain everything, you know, and enumerate everything. There's a constant, like, running commentary about everything, right? He's going to start writing it down. <laughs> and I'm like... What do you mean? That's that's just common sense. And in my opinion, that's one of the reasons why organizations don't create conditions for success. Because sometimes the customer assumes those those things, you know, will exist and they don't even write them down. They never ask for them. And the partner takes it literally. They're like, okay, we're just going to create a bunch of canvas apps. Please, where's my, I don't know, 50 grand or whatever, you know? That's why I believe this is one of the reasons why organizations started being so focused on, on workload still instead of going a bit deeper. I love what you just said for a couple of reasons. One, because I'm, I am, it is true, super into this book. And, and I should say that Anna is correct. Uh, according to this book, it's The Culture Map by uh, Aaron Meyer. I cannot I – mean, everyone on this podcast should read it since, you know, we do have this podcast, five people from five different countries. In any case, yeah, the uh, Americans are notoriously the most um, – the, the, the biggest explainers on earth, right? We're very used to having to explain ourselves um, and, and to be quite literal about, about everything. But nonetheless – Anna, what I love about what I love about what you just said is that there's all these things that I think you sort of take for granted that are implicit. We're going to go build this app, or we're going to go implement this workload, and there's all these things that need to happen in order to make that successful. So let me pull us back to what really creating the conditions for success are. Right, creating the conditions for success is all about putting in place 
those things, and you talk about some of them, environments, ALM. See, now I'm explaining what Anna just said, right? <laughs> I am a low context communicator being, being American and such. But creating the conditions for success is about building those things such that they are reusable and that they are available and then doing it at scale. So that rather than saying we're going to leave every app that is built or every workload that is implemented to go deal with its own ALM, to go deal with its own environment strategy, to go deal with its own security model, to do its own monitoring, et cetera, et cetera, we're going to build them all and we're going to nurture and mature those capabilities from a central place so that they are available across the ecosystem so that apps can be built and Things can be automated and workloads can be implemented faster without without the redundancy of having to do this again and again and again and again each time. And to connect this back to what Will said earlier, that really is what a COE is. That's what a cloud COE is. It's not about, oh, did you deploy the monitoring tool? It is, did you build the components that people can use again and again and again so that they will be more successful? And why wouldn't you want to do that as a business? It's a lot cheaper. <laughs> oh God! I mean, by by the way, <laughs> don't don't rebuild, reuse. You've already wasted the effort. So yeah, no, that was that was a beautiful summary. Uh, I'll give you that five or later then, Andrew. Are, are you on, are you do you prefer Monzo or Revolut? I'll just send you a bill. I'll send you a bill now. One thing that your concept has raised, Andrew, around moving away from technology-led practices to industry-led practices is something that um, some years ago, I remember sitting in a meeting with a one of the largest insurance companies in the world, and I was sitting in the room with them uh, with with um, the, co the context being, the context being, it was in, Australia, in Australia, but the CTO was Australian for the global org, right? So, he was making a name for himself as part of that. And he came to Microsoft and I was in the room as a Microsoft guest um, for the conversation. And it was around Microsoft. We want you in the room. We want, we, we, we want to understand what you have seen in other industries that you can bring to the table. We don't just want to buy your software off you, but we believe that you're operating in all these unrelated industry areas. And there's probably insights that you've learned that you could apply to our business. That wouldn't be a conflict or anything like that, but this is totally unrelated because we're so head down in our industry vertical that we don't see what we can't see. So there's, how do you tackle that in that industry conversation? And then the other thing is, you know, I work for a small company that is very technology practice centric and those practices are, you know, have their P&Ls and they even compete for the same customer with their technology stack. And I thought it was a brilliant idea of, hey, focusing it around industry. How do you then address the community of people that have chosen a skill area, a, a skilled area that they're in, but now it's like they're not getting that exposure to cross industries because – Let's take three industries. Let's take mining and gas. Let's take banking or financial services. And let's take um, government. Does that mean inside my organization, because I you know, specialize in a particular subset of Microsoft being um, business applications, does that mean I now, as a leader in that space, need to create one team of people for each of those industries and play those teams in and how do you it starts to get complex right so what are your thoughts on how you keep that simple that you still allow people to to share that tacit knowledge that they learn off each other from being in the same space that when they look at the leaders in the industry space they can see somebody they're modeling towards my concern would be do you create that team becomes very disparate and already we're in a very disparate world since covid where most of my staff do not see each other face to face, not every, every every couple of months, right? They are out on customer projects. They are remote. They are working from home. How do you create that back to culture? And I, I know you talked about the culture map, and I quickly looked to see if 
I'd read it, but it's the culture code that I've read, which by the way, is an amazing, amazing book, which is around setting culture in your teams. Well, and on the next episode of Ecosystems, we're just going to have a book club. We're just going to talk about, you know, <laughs> it'll be amazing. I actually, right? read the cult, the, I actually read the culture code uh, as well, but all of the hints are in person, right? All of the, all of this, most of the strategies, all of the uh, recipes for, for success you know, revolve about uh, around people being in the same room, restaurant, war zone, yeah. etc. But we have to change it, right? Our world has changed so much. And, and so I'm always resistant when people go, that's why we need to be back in the office. And I know we're slightly pivoting here, but no, we've got to go, hey, this is a new world of work. How do we still create culture? Without going, oh, it only works under one dimension, which is, you know, you're you're in the same bar together. I think we should actually come back to um, this. This is a good topic, maybe for yeah, the end a- of the end of the discussion because we should, we need we need we need to talk about remote work on ecosystems. Mm-hmm, we, we need mm-hmm, to tackle mm-hmm. that. But Mark, you asked a lot of questions there, but your first yeah. one, I think, is a really interesting one, which was more around creating the conditions for success. But in this case, we're talking about resource operational models. So you're, you're you know, you, you stated saying, look, you know, in, in a world where we're saying we, we should get more focused, and we definitely should, on industry-led approaches. So not, not technology-led, but industry-led. And let's face it, actually, let's, let's bring some more color back into this. So we know that Salesforce to, my, you know, to Microsoft have always been an absolute bloody nightmare to them. But one thing we can always say about Salesforce, whether if you like their tech or not, you know, which I'm not entirely against it, although I'll probably get Satchin Adela come knock on the door in a minute and beat me up. He, he seems like a nice guy, actually. Uh, I could take him. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's these... Uh, <laughs> these For those oh. of you who don't know, Will is a... <laughs> Very, like like Will is a very tall man, right? So so a very tall ex yeah. yeah. And he could definitely take Mark. Sorry, bro. Yeah. We all seem the same the same height, but we are not. <laughs> we'll we'll post a picture at the next reunion. But what what's going on is we all know that Salesforce are phenomenal sellers, actually. And they were really good at understanding you needed to be industry aligned before Microsoft started with their Cloud 4 approach. And what I'm trying to say there is actually, if we go then back to to Mark's question, which is that that operational model, it comes down to a, a resourcing part, right? And I'm, I'm just going to sort of speak and, and not really answer it and, and leave it and, and get opinions. But it's something partners have discussed for uh, for a long time, which is, right, if we are industry aligned, do we do that by pods? Do we have like a, a mini board where we'll have a, a commercial lead, a technology lead, we'll have, we'll have a client services lead, and they work together, and then you actually have maybe pre-sales underneath them, or is pre-sales centralized elsewhere, and then... You know, in Central Gulf, for example, in the UK, you have GDS knowledge, CDDO knowledge. That is very specialist. How deep do we take that? Do we leave that with the architects, make sure they're aligned? Or do we allow the architects to be part of a central resourcing model that allows them to float between the various industries? And the problem is, if you leave an architect or a lead consultant too long in one industry, you get that message going, well, I've been on the project for a year and I'm a bit bored and I've seen what they're doing over in commercial and it's sounding really exciting. So, it's a really tough question to ask because you have the logic behind best practice and industry best practice, but then you have the human factor of we actually get bored quite quick if we stay in one area. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I I think I think that I mean let let let's be clear we we've now moved on from a technology discussion as this group tends to do, uh, but we're going to boomerang right right back around to become very technology focused. I'm sure, but so but let's talk about the the people side of this. Um, and, and I think that there's a number of techniques that an organization can sort of blend together. You don't need to do all these things. Um, but but here's some here's some ideas. First of all, technology centric practices, I think actually can be they're, they're very useful, right? They create opportunities for people to learn from one another. And whatever kind of goes into that from a leadership perspective, and what does the practice offer? in terms of learning and development and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think that that's a pretty open, open question and different organizations are going to do different things, but the technology centric practice should not have the financial incentives or should not have 
P&L attached to it, there are other ways, I think, to measure the success of that technology. I also think that allowing your people to affiliate with different, with multiple practices is really useful, right? So allow someone to um, be a part of your digital and app innovation practice and your data platform practice, for example. Encourage that. Those are those are, are are great opportunities for for people. I think that rotation is also useful. You know, so I, I spent I, I grew up in the with the U.S. Coast Guard. I've spent a lot of time around military organizations, and this is something actually that I think that that at least Western militaries do quite well. Right? Is that they say, "Listen, you're going to spend a length of time in this job, and then we're going to move you." You're going to get moved on to something else, and you're going to learn something else, and you're going to get exposed to something else. So within a within a IT organization or within a technology partner, say, we're going to put you in this role for a period of time, and you're going to focus on this technology, and then we're going to move you to this technology. And you do that with people earlier on in their career before they start to specialize and repeat the trick across industries so that then people are going into that insurance firm and they're saying, yeah, you know, this is what you're doing and you know your industry very well. But let me tell you what I was doing last year when I was over in public sector, when I was over in manufacturing. But, but, but Andrew, whatever. that goes back to the thing what we're saying about, you know, why Satya Nadella has done so well with Microsoft. So I'm going back and wanting to fight him now. I'm praising him again, which is putting different teams <laughs> with each other and actually relates back to, you know, although you didn't say this explicitly, but when you was talking about the culture map, and the fact that we all have different views, different perspectives, and we all have different experiences. Like, you know, you just spoke about your, your more military upbringing. That's completely different to other people in America who wouldn't have had that. So they would have had a different slice altogether. And that's why it's so important that we have diverse teams as well. So not just diverse technology, but diverse teams of, from people from all different places, that melting pot of both talent, views, and technologies. And then that's a true ecosystem enabler. But you can't do that if you're, if you're, you're, personnel organization, right? You're, if you can't do that if your talent and your, your HR organization is just treating this as business as usual. I'm going to recruit people. I'm going to put them in a role and I'm going to, you know, deal with their Absolutely. payroll and their benefits and everything. You have to be a really kind of activist HR team in order to, to prioritize that kind of rotation, prioritize that opportunity creation. HR resourcing and hire. Exactly. Exactly. And that gives a great culture. And they're the companies that thrive. Yeah. I think that is a wonderful thing to do. And I do believe organizations should have that flexibility and that enablement throughout. Yeah. So that people can actually do that. But then it doesn't always work for everyone because humans are messy. And humans are complicated. So you may have person X who's a bit bored of their industry and they'd like to do a little bit of commercial, but they hate the boss at commercial. <laughs> or they don't hate the boss at commercial. They actually quite like them, but they have deep loyalty for their present leader. So they feel bad to sort of switch things around, yeah? It's a motive, yeah. Or people are bored of what they're doing, but they love the feeling of knowing what they're doing. You know, in Microsoft, we always have this prepare to leave with constant ambiguity thing. And it doesn't really work for everyone. Also, people need to have a very high level of agency. And whereas that works with very junior personnel, in my opinion, because you will move them from one area or one industry to another industry, and they will be open to learning. And this is their job in the end, you know, to learn more and eventually to produce results for their company. I think it's going to be increasingly harder for people who are more senior and who by then they have families, they have messy lives. They really don't feel like 
going and exploring and no new friends. Do you know the song? No new friends. That that's that sort of thing. You know. Could you could you sing it to us? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but I'll teach. I you but I'll teach that. Andrew. <laughs> but I'll I'll teach Andrew the song and then he'll sing it to you because he has a beautiful, gorgeous voice. But I mean, what I'm saying, including in my team and Microsoft, because in my team and Microsoft, people were were and are allowed to choose their technology every year. And you will be surprised that they choose the same thing over and over and over again. And whoever doesn't choose the same thing over and over and over again tends to be more successful, exactly like you're saying, and tends to have and tends to have a broader view, but also a more difficult life. So my question here would be, who are we talking to right now? And through this podcast, who are we addressing? Are we addressing people who are ready to go above and above and beyond? Or are we addressing or and is that enough for our organizations to succeed? Are there enough people who are willing to do that? So to answer your immediate question, it's only my mum that I know that listens to this podcast to support us. My, my dad any... has gotten super into this, actually. Yeah. So it's, it's... there are only listeners, uh, quite quite frankly. <laughs> but I would say the answer to your question is yes, Anna. Which no, is no matter how old everybody, we get, it's still our parents listening. To this. Yes. <laughs> I think the answer is complex. I mean, what Andrew and I was, I think the point was come from is more of a utopic situation of tr trying the best to enable people. But of course, as anyone that's been in a, a senior position, an executive position, it's more complex than that. And actually, most of your time is dealing with HR issues, isn't it? So, <laughs> yeah, it is tough. I think that's a whole podcast episode on itself. Utopic. What the heck is that? Well, I guess utopia. Oh, you like nice. That? You know, I sorry, rednecks like me just we, you know. Gotcha, gotcha. And this is this is a great point, and I think that we, you know, we we need to be careful to not just fashion a world that is what we are into. And this is something that Anna and I have talked a lot about, because yes, this is what we talk about when we have dinner together. Mm -hmm. And that's that the. There's a there is a need for specialists. There is a need for people who are really focused in one area of the technology. Like I can make cloud security work to a really deep level. I can make the data platform work to a really deep level. And then there is where where I think that there's a lot of growth potential are for the people who know enough about a lot of things to piece them together. Right. And to create that vision and to create that ecosystem architecture and then involve and empower and pass this stuff to the really, really deep experts in a particular technology. And there's a symbiotic relationship between those people. Right. In that it is the experts in the particular technology that are going to make the thing work. But it is the uh, I'm going to use the, the phrase cloud strategist again, which I, I was talking with someone recently about. It's the cloud strategist that has to continually bring those experts to the table together and say, hey, you know, this is what we need to do in order to uh, achieve the best interests of the whole. And it's a real give and take. There's no specific recipe here. There's no way for us to divine every scenario. But I think that that's really important. And, and it, it, it's necessary because the technology is moving too quickly at this point for the people who know one area deeply to know enough about everything that's happening. And it's uh, moving too quickly for the people who know how to piece everything together to really, I think, get intimate with a particular, you know, to go build out a particular workload or to architect something really specific. We have to do this. First up, we're going to go around the room with a few questions. Just so Andrew knows where his question's going to appear. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, go, it's going to be I'm first. I'm not going to live this down. It, it's going to be first. It's going to be first. Okay. So, Will, Anna, you've got time to think about this. When you think of going overseas on a flight to a conference, a big conference, where you know you're going to be three days walking the massive 
metropolis of a conference center, the scale like they have in Vegas. What are the kind of key things that you want to make sure you're carrying on your person? You you don't want to lug like a laptop around, right? You don't want to, as in, but what are kind of the key things that you know through to get you through the day so you don't have to go back to your hotel room, that type of thing? What's, for want of a better term, American term, what's in your fanny pack? Oh, so, <laughs> so, so. I, I sum you really want a fanny pack, by the way. No, I, <laughs> don't, don't we all? <laughs> no. <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> I mean, it's the same thing. He wants to carry it like this, but it's honestly it's the same thing. Can I just point out that this is the second episode in a row in which my obsession with man bags has come up? I mean, it's just... Um... I just bought one yesterday. <laughs> nice. Can, we, can can you model it for us? Oh no no it's come, as in I purchased it yesterday that means it's got to come across the world it's it's a Bellroy is yours a Bellroy? Oh. Yeah, of course. Oh, no, shall we leave? Shall we leave? Because uh, yeah. <laughs> I have a Bellroy inside of my Bellroy. It's it's a great, it's great stuff. Bellroys are amazing. Yeah. So so question up your 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 first Andrew. What's your kind of must have? I have I have an iPad mini and I love the thing. Um, I actually I, I used to have one of the, the largest iPads you could have. And I finally decided, you know, I have this giant this giant iPad, which I really only have for like five percent of my use cases. So I downsized. But I love that that iPad mini is um, uh, is fantastic. Do they still have the iPad mini? Can you still buy it? I thought they discontinued it. I, they no, it it's beautiful. Um, okay, and in theory, Anna and I also use it when we when we fly um, because the baby. <laughs> no, no. I just the so baby sleeps soundly. The baby sleeps soundly, and we're able and we're able to watch a show. But except for the baby, does that happen, Anna? Is that that's not a real thing? Yeah, right, right. No, but that was the plan. Okay, so you have an iPad Mini. What else, Andrew, in your fanny pack? <laughs> What else? What else do you, you you always want to make sure? What's on your checklist? A flask. Nice. Yep. Water. Okay. Hydration. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No, you're exactly. you're actually meaning a flask. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, well. So I also have this. Uh, I also have this water bottle here that um, I don't even know if this works, but they did a great job selling it to me. It is the Lark water bottle where um, you. It it's uh, it uses UV light to sterilize yes. the water. So I don't know if anything's really happening, but I feel good about it. Are we doing product placement on this? Yeah, I reckon. My gosh. My gosh. Last one, last one. When I go to a conference, what's the number one thing that I like to have with me? It's Anna. It's true. Aw. <laughs> it's so sweet. That's so sweet. It's evening time where you are, right? Uh, yes, but she's in she's in <laughs> Romania and I'm in London right now. Anna, what what's on your list of things that you want to pack to make sure you're prepared like a good Girl Scout? Uh, no, I I think no product placement here. Mm-hmm. I actually bring uh, I actually bring a bunch of stuff. I bring um, my phone, a portable battery um headphones or like my airpods there you go product placement. product placement there you go i always bring a lipstick i so bring will. deodorant yes What's that? yes will does as well is that yeah. because you asked yeah. me to andrew yes yes yeah <laughs> so lipstick deodorant uh which is very important to me water bottle as well yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's about it. Once upon a time I used to bring shoes as well because I was wearing impossible heels. Yes. But now I'm old so I just wear flats. Um, yeah, so me too. I don't I'm not exactly not wearing shoes anymore in my bag. That's it. Speaking of water bottles, why don't why don't you tell everyone what you did to poor Chippy here? It was all out of good intentions and uh he was he was not well, I threw it across a ferry. It was not on purpose. I'm sorry, Chippy. It, it's true. Yeah. 
Will, what 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 are your what are your must? I love foods? these little insights we get into Anna exactly, and Andrew's relationship. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I mean the fact that they've named it Chippy. Anyway, so I obviously <laughs> I thank you for letting me go almost last here, Mark, because I, I got to have a little bit more thinking, which I which I do need. So water is a must for me. I, I you can tell I've drunk all of this since being on this podcast. Uh, so I, I, I consume a lot. Um, another one for me is a Belvita. Because I end up, I, I walk so much and I can't have, so I take, I like taking a little snack. And I sometimes just, if we end up going out to a pub or something, I'll sneak it out there and just have a, a lovely little snack when I'm hungry. Uh, portable battery, because a big thing for me is actually I find conferences quite overwhelming. Although I appear really extrovert, which I am, I still need a lot of recharging time on my own. So I can just plug in Netflix, watch a podcast. Then the last two... One is a notepad because I'm very hyperactive and I forget actually yes. what I, conversations I've had, although I've really enjoyed them and I want to remember. And the last one, which is, I hope you all do this because it's a phenomenal trick. We go to these events. We then, if I'm with Mark or Andrew and Anna, we go to the pub. It's suddenly 2 a.m. You go back to your hotel and you go, which room number am I? Yeah. Uh, so you t- take, take, a, take, a, picture, a, picture take yes. a picture of your room number and that, that's it. That's what I take with me and I'm good to go then. Can, I, mean, I was just going to say that the, the number one thing, because there's a lot of commonality here, but the number one thing that I don't see enough people doing when they go to these conferences, it's not about what you bring or what you carry. It's about the thought you put in before you go. I always like to say, listen, I'm going to go to this conference. These are the things Stress that I want to learn. And these are the conversations that I want to have. So it's it, it's put a little thought into things you want to learn and also things that you want to achieve or ideas that you want to tee up, tee up um, uh, that level of preparation before a conference, I think is, is really useful and not enough people are doing it. Um, so, so do that. I agree. I agree. And, and, you know, I'll, I'll put up on screen the reason I asked, I found out this week that my executive layer want me in Vegas is be the first big trip that I have done since, um, since leaving the UK. Oh, wow. That's really amazing. And of course, I'm going back to going, shit, what are, you know, I'm very checklist type person. And I'm like, like, I used to always have these sleeping pills that you can only buy in America that are just epic for planes. I can get on and listen before takeoff as a rule on any flight before takeoff, I can, I can, I've trained myself to go to sleep. But if I really want to stay in that deep sleep for a long time, I pop a couple of these little blue pills and they are just amazing to keep me that's sound not asleep. That's most people use blue pills. Yeah, that's not what blue pills are for. I said blue pills, and they are gel caps. Um, I, I knew you guys were going to go there. I mean, that sounds like quietly flight, and it really does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But on a plane, yeah. Mark, come on. What? What? Yeah, yeah, exactly. The Mile High Club was invented for a reason. A couple other things I, w- I just want to bring up here. Oh, I'll come back to that one. Um, on our first podcast, Nathan uh, Ross uh, made this comment here, and I said we would discuss it on the next podcast, but he actually asked it the day that we had recorded our previous podcast. So it's Chris Huntingford's post, as you can see. So he's actually made the show, even though he's not made the show. And you can see here that this chat it was great to watch, specifically – He's, he's saying to me, I've previously advocated where we should specialize due to the growing size and complexity of BizApp stack from Microsoft. So would love to hear more about how, as BizApp professionals, should we prepare to position ourselves for tomorrow? Great episode. Thanks. Okay. So thanks, Nathan. Great to, to have your engagement. And I said, listen, we will, um, I think under these replies, I said, hey, we'll bring up in the, these comments in the next episode. And so if you're commenting, by the way, and we think it's great, we'll, we'll bring it onto the show. But I suppose I'll give my opinion. You guys can give yours. What he's referring to in the 90 day mentoring challenge that I did, you know, I started in the UK and I, I ran it for five years. I would say that biz apps had grown so large that when I started my career and I started in the MSCRM back in 2003, so 20 years ago, you learnt sales, marketing, customer service, and then for three years, you were sweet, right? Because the product release cycle was only once every three years. So you could easily become the guru of gurus by studying hard in the first month and then just building on that for the next three years. I was saying now we've got over 30 different applications just in the BizApps ecosystem. 
then you've got the M365, then you've got Azure, then you've got AWS, Google Cloud Platform, SAP, blah, blah, all the others, right? And so now we're we're dealing with a plethora of technologies that are demanding our time. And I used to be very big on what we would call T consultant, right? You need to be broad across everything, but you need to have a depth in a single area. My thoughts have evolved over time, and I feel that you need to be an M consultant, which is you need to really have three key skill depth areas now in business. Yes, you still need to be broad, but just the way the world's evolving, right? One of those legs should be something AI and where we are, right? Without a doubt, you should be developing your strength in that. So I suppose my idea is I, I still believe that you need to have your core skill area. And I suppose, Andrew, throwing to you, what are your thoughts around, you know, as we've talked about, uh, so many consultants are at that top of the pyramid. They're really cut their, let's say they're, they're brilliant at field service, Dynamics 365 field service, and they are the go-to person for that. Do they just stay there or how do they become more relevant? And after our conversations just now, perhaps people that are, are deep in that won't want to actually look at a broader ecosystem landscape. But what are your thoughts to to Nathan's question? So I think that in the and this is in the biz apps space particularly, we we could answer this question differently for other areas of of the cloud. But thinking in biz apps specifically, um, I think there are far too many uh, far too many practitioners in biz apps that don't really have a firm grasp or even a passing grasp of what's happening underneath of the functional layer of the application, right? So I'm not saying that you need to, you need to um, be able to sit down and, and, and create your own, say, data model from the ground up and build a completely custom application, right? I think that there is a very, very useful and important place for the functional knowledge that many business applications practitioners have. But I think that you need to put some energy into understanding what's happening under the covers, understanding how data is modeled, understanding how this application or this functional business area that you know really deeply, how does it integrate and plug into the rest of the ecosystem? Um, because I, I just I, I see a lot of people who I think take for granted that the app is going to be there and really don't understand how it's integrating with other things or where it fits, um, uh, how data flows, how data moves, how um, you know how at a at a basic level how AI works, right? Like how that data is indexed or um, you know how a, a large language model works. So I think that. The more time you can spend understanding what's under the covers of the thing that you know really well, um, that's only going to help you to be um, to be more rich in in that thing that that you have chosen. Presumably because you're really passionate about it and you love it, so keep on doing that. Uh, but understand what's happening behind the curtain. I like it. Okay, next next one I have here. We're getting a lot of comments, more comments now on the the post. And this one just came in as in so this is I, I, I love like thanks guys. Thank you. Keep keep this coming. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, uh, totally. So this was our once again our first episode. And if you go down here, I, I and if you get a chance, um can you read that there? Uh, does someone actually want to read out? In an ideal world, that that one, in an ideal world, the executive board would set the overall business goals. And since technology is so embedded in operations, it would be the board's collective responsibility to answer the question of what the business goal they feel technologies can have and the most significant impact on. This would pave the way for a well-guided digital transformation journey. Correct. The CTO, CIO, with this top-down guidance, uh, could focus on implementation. Leveraging enterprise architecture would ensure they select the best tech to address the identified challenges. So before before we go on, as we'll let people go um, read it, but these are the type of, I love this type of feedback on what we're doing, right? That like people, you know, it's nice to have, I love this, it's an excellent podcast. Yep, I love it. That's, uh, um, I love the pat on the back. That's awesome. But I love it when people are getting into the discord of the conversation, right? And they're 
they're contributing, they're adding something to it. So, hey, head on over to the show on YouTube if you want. That's that's the one we publish all on LinkedIn, etc. And jump in the comments. We really w- want to see that. I'm pretty sure Andrew soon is going to release a website where we're going to land all this content on, and that will be the kind of we'll, we'll, we'll fire you all that way. Guys, do you have anything else that you want to share or should I carry on? Because I just got a couple of things that are just top of mind at the moment. I would add one thing. I, I love the fact that <clears throat> the conclusion of that post, and Mark didn't let me read the whole thing because I suck at reading. <clears throat> but uh, the conclusion the conclusion of that post is that Everything is about education and communication and how do we influence our boards and our C-levels to see the broader picture, to make the correct assessment. And that's that's just wonderful. If that was the conclusion of our first episode, then it's just wonderful. I love it. Yeah, really good. I also, uh, another thing, Jeff Comstock just came out with a post and I found it really interesting and he says here and he's lifted an image there from Starfield which we're going to talk about in a second but they have been running co-pilots now across remember co-pilot for Dynamics and Power Platform hasn't GA'd yet right GA's next month um, but they've been running it across tens of thousands of call center staff in Microsoft and it's worth looking at the the things like call summaries, call summary going down from to being a 10 to 15 minute process that was a 30 to 45 minute process per person in the past. So it's well worth taking a look at this post to see, you know, if you're like it's been used in production and massive scale, um, you know, eating their own dog food, as Microsoft says. But well worth it, because I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting a lot of questions lately about where AI plays in the power platform. Um, there's a lot of confusion around M365 and the and the licensing skew related to that. And is that part of biz apps? And there's just a bit of confusion. So I seem to be doing a lot of conversations, but it's well worth. Go read this. Um, um, as I say, Jeff Comstock, go read his post because it's exciting to see this. I've always felt that Microsoft, when for years, Google, I, I suppose I was in London when I noticed this the most, Google was always talking about, you know, their AI. They were talking about um, Go and how it outperformed, you know, real people and stuff. And I always liked a kind of thing from Microsoft is that they were the practical AI company. They were the usable. They were the AI company that provides tools that allow people in their day-to-day role to do stuff. Sure, they could have tools if they wanted that solve massive, you know, chess games or, you know, Go, but that's not usable by 99% of the rest of us that are not smart enough to play chess or go. So I think that I love the way Microsoft's bring to bear this real practicality with Copilot. The last thing I will say is this. Look at that glorious image there. To add to that glorious image of Starfield, and you, uh, I notice a few of you looking blank, you're like, what is Starfield? Here, Look at this. This is what I've been doing this morning. Not, not while I've been doing this. This is not why my camera's been switching off. 52 <laughs> gigs of an 86 gig download of Starfield that just became available. But this is the game of games. If you want to do something. Is this sponsored content again? This Mark? is not Sorry, sponsored just, content. Yeah, no, okay. But it, it is Microsoft content um, because this is their game. But I'm just saying, as an, last weekend, I was with my nephew and he uh, on his Xbox whatever account he's got, he had early access to this and he had taken eight days off work just to play this game for the next eight days. <laughs> he had taken leave and uh, I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. But this is, you know, it actually reminds me of a game I used to play years ago called Half-Life. This is epic. If uh, if you're looking for a game um, of right now, this is the game you want to check out. And with that, mic drop. Come on, what do you guys bring to the table? What's what's in your news? <laughs> it's really uh, interesting. I'm just going to take it back to Copilot for just one second. I've been talking to um, a, a few people who have startups, and one of them is my is my brother, 
And my brother's a brilliant coder, but uh, with having a startup, he doesn't code every day anymore. So when we're talking about, okay, how specialized can you actually be when you want to do more, you quickly, you know, find that you're forgetting syntax and things like that. He was telling me the rate at which Copilot is accelerating his own work because he forgets uh, you know, syntax or best practices or, or things like that for certain uh, areas of his own coding experience. And if you've got, uh, you know, a startup and you're pushing apps into App Source and into Google Play or what's the Google Android? Anyway. Yeah, Google Play sets it. Yeah. These platforms, they have certain rules and things like that. So the moment you do something, you need to follow all of the, those rules. And Copilot reminds you of those rules and, and standards. And you make sure that, you know, everything's set. And these people's perception was the fact that Copilot's going to be, and it is right now, definitely accelerating their work and their release cycles by at least 20% from senior staff mm -hmm. and that they're lowering their productivity in junior staff, which is just fabulous. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have heard any of uh, anything like that, how co-pilots work really well if you're a specialist but not as well if you're just starting up. Interesting. So what I was going to come up was backing up the the, the efficiency aspect. So I I've, I started rolling out uh, Copilot uh, across across our organization, and the feedback's just been phenomenal. You know, and this has been going on for a while. We, we started as a test, like you do, and mm -hmm. the one thing that they the one bit of feedback, and I think we did mention this as well, which is with democratization it does and can to certain people create inertia and you know the issue is because is it is picking up some of the stuff that you might be bored by writing your test scripts and other aspects they have said they they've some of them have started saying well i've actually started forgetting how to code certain elements and you're going well okay that is that an issue or isn't it is it a case that actually is making life easier and actually you don't have to think about that anymore or is it a case that actually it's going to create a load of lazy coders in the future and that's going to make it even <laughs> harder to be juniors and seniors? But, but let's see, but we, we don't know, do we? Because this is new territory. Will there be any coders in five years? There will be some. Depends how AGI goes. <laughs> I, I used to build my own computers, right? Now I, I, I carry, a, carry a MacBook, right? So uh, more product placement. But anyway, the <laughs> so, so just because... Most of us don't build our own computer anymore. Doesn't mean that nobody is building the, you know, building the thing. So I, he, Mark builds his own. There you go. Beautiful. I don't. <laughs> There's no way I do. My gosh, I pay people to do it. Do you know why? Because honestly, I spec what I want, right? And then I pay for it to be done because computer builders these days, it's an art form. Like they know how to, Every cable is just clipped perfectly. The airflow is is validated. It's like it's crazy. That's not that old, and I'm already looking at a nine thousand dollar replacement for that box that will that has better grills, that has a faster GPU, of course, and um, things have just come a long way in the last two or three years. So you so, can create your PowerPoint presentations at double. The I speed. know, right? <laughs> I, I, exactly, exactly. But if you do, if you actually do gaming, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But if not, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 4K artwork looks amazing on it. I bet. Especially that game you're downloading. Can't wait. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but, 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 but going back to what we're saying about the coding, though, it's a bit like everything. You, Everything at some point, everything does start to evolve out. You know, if you think about windmills, water mills, or that, you, yes, you start yes, yes. moving on. So, you know, there will be an evolution of all things. How quick it happens, how fast it happens, who knows? But there is a level of inertia it's already started to generate. And that's my biggest concern. I think we discussed this before. And I'm creating a, a, a website at the moment that I'm working on called Data Science Frontiers, which is I'm so concerned that. We're, we're 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 at this. Uh, we've gone fully into you know the the AI realm. You know it really has arrived. 
yet people are throwing their data into it and not actually understanding how it's processing, how it's being used. Because it's been doc- de- 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 uh, democratised, sorry, getting quite late in the evening here. So I think actually the educational aspect is so important. Yeah. And yeah. to not create lazy people that just throw stuff in and, and, and expect an output. Yeah. I think that it's time for Anna to wrap things up for us and have the last word. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a big, uh, that, that's a big, uh, responsibility, you know, um, I'll wrap this up by copying you from, from last week very quickly. Um, tell me one thing you've learned this week. And if not, why didn't you Mark, you go first. I love it. I love it. So right now I'm focused um, for the last actually three weeks, four weeks, maybe, maybe last six weeks um, on sustainability. And we've seen a, a massive index on the environment component of sustainability. But if you really look at what, um, you know, the full gamut, it's actually environment. Um, it is social and it is uh, governance. So it's ESG, it's these three key layers. And we've done a lot around what are we doing around carbon emissions, et cetera. Very indexed on that, you know, the E, the environment part of ECG. But I think that we're, sorry, ESG, we're going to see a massive growth. And this is what I'm learning about is that social responsibility and then the governance um, and the impact. You know, EU laws are about to roll if not, I don't know if they have already, but um, about to come out. This the US are, are, are dropping big laws. Um, uh, I've just worked with a, a major mining company that is looking at how they manage carbon credits and things like that, and we're building systems for them to do that. So I think this is a massive growth space. That's, so that's what I'm learning about. And and then I mean, at the end of the day, this is a massive data play, right? If you look at everything about from our lens, um, as in how does it practically create opportunity it is a mega data play and from multiple inputs so yeah it's exciting cool awesome uh will you're next do you know what i'm I'm gonna i'm gonna go for the absolute purest answer which is away from tech and everything else and just personal life i've been building an outdoor kitchen and i've uh i've got to the countertop and i've been learning how to use this thing called ardex feather finish which is like concrete and you, 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 you can only make, and, and I love it because I'm so hyperactive and I like to do things very quick. You can't do that quick. And you only get to make small <laughs> batches and you have to do it in a very slow manner. And yeah, I've just been really learning that actually stuff like concrete, that's incredibly permanent, you know, learning patience and how to, to mold that. So that's what's been a, you know, I did that literally before I came on today. And it's, yeah, it's been quite a learning curve. So I'm looking forward to going back out and seeing how it's dried, to be honest. I like uh, it. So that, I like it. That's my one. <laughs> Uh, hopefully, hopefully, Andrew's had enough time to think about his answer. Thank you. Thank you. So what I have learned this week, I continue to read about this um, uh, this new or this this trend of people being called back into the office. So my learning for this week is that the return to office stupidity has no bounds. And here's what I mean by this. I read these studies where they, you know, and, and I'm going to pull some numbers out because I don't have them in front of me, but 47% of all people who work from home primarily are disengaged, but only 42% of people who work in the office are disengaged. And you have these senior executives who are super obsessed about, well, we need to bring these people back to the office so that they're more engaged. And you're solving the wrong problem here, folks. The problem you really should be solving is why are why are almost half of your people disengaged regardless of where they're working? So <laughs> return to office stupidity has no bounds. And I wonder how long it's going to take uh, before this latest peculiar trend um, uh, fizzles out. But in the meantime, it seems like yeah. we're going to do the maximum to disrupt people's lives for no real appreciable gain. Um, yeah. So we'll see. I see Zoom, Zoom, which just seems weird to me, right? They they had a big issue around calling people back to the office. Uh, Grinder came out yesterday with um, a lot out. of controversy. Yeah, no, yeah, Grinder came out. No, yeah, <laughs> because they are they are forcing all their staff back into the office, and that's you know it's. I think it's a it's a fool's errand, you know, this forcing people back into the office. It's a it's it's a silliness. 
it's focusing on the wrong things, like Andrew said. It's focusing on the wrong. If you, if you know, I, I, Andrew, that was brilliant. If 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 your people are disengaged, there's a reason for it. Bring them into an office. It's not going to change that. Right. Right. Well, actually, it's because I had time. You see, now um, I've learned. Uh, I've learned two things, or rather, I've studied a bit of one thing and then learned uh, another. Um, I've studied a little bit about how charity works uh, and how charity organizations work successfully, uh, so that they actually help people. You know, instead of I don't know, deploying mosquito nets that then, you know, people use for fishing and stuff like that. You know, it's just like, and it's, it's really fascinating, the whole, uh, the whole charity um, industry, if we can call it that way. Um, it's very interesting and there's a lot to learn still. I personally have a problem with some of the... Um, habits that some of the charity organizations do have or not for profit uh, rather uh, have I'm just invested in knowing more about those organizations who, who manage to you know build homes build, build host, hostels with with few resources without having the need to uh, I don't know travel business class and, and so on and so forth um, so this is one subject that uh, I'm very passionate about right now. I learned how to sew lace on a dress or on a wedding dress rather. I helped my best, my, my good friend do that for my own dress and it's really fascinating the hard work and j just the vision of it, you know, because it looks like crap at the beginning. And it's just, it's just fabulous. That's what I learned <laughs> this week. <laughs> hey, thanks for listening. I'm your host, business application MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365 Guy. If there's a guest you'd like to see on the show, please message me on LinkedIn. If you want to be a supporter of the show, please check out buymeacoffee.com forward slash NZ365 Guy. Stay safe out there and shoot for the stars.